Um, if you're wanting to submit, <laughs> thank you. Um, if you're wanting to submit a project that affects downtown Anchorage, for example, I'll just use center baggage as, as our example, um, that's gonna automatically go to that district. And it's gonna show up in the CAPSIS program as that specific district that would be in that case, Rep Field, Senator Begich using this year's lines. And um, so it'll show up on our end as for a request that comes in for that district. So the CAPSIS programmers have to actually reformulate every little neighborhood and how everything gets parceled out by member. So that's gonna take a little bit of extra time because those district lines have changed this year. And um, so the date for the CAPS is opening might be a little different. I don't know specifically when yet, um, but I believe that will come from the Senate Finance Co-Chairs and or Legislative Finance Division. And after that point, you can start asking your Senator for a sub account login. So, if you're not sure who to contact because your project is statewide, I would recommend the finance co-chair perhaps as a starting point or just a senator that you'd like. You know, I mean, it could be as simple as that. This, if you happen to have a good friend that it happens to be a senator now or a longtime connection there, I'm sure they could help you. There's not a, it's not a specific rule there, but we could have, each office can help uh, help you set up a sub account and get you the information to do that. And um, so the website to do that is, um, I'll put here in the chat as well, is legfin.alaskaledge.gov. So that means ledgefinance.alaskalegislature.government. So that's how that spells out. So legfin.alaskaledge.gov. And that's the website that um, you'll find the uh, a number of things, including the budget handbook. There's a really wonderful document on the homepage right now. Um, and forgive me, I'm not going to share my screen because I always screw it up. <laughs> so I'm just not going to. And it freezes and it's a mess. So if you go to that website, check it out. It's pretty, it's very intuitive. On the front page, on the homepage on the right side, you'll see legislative budget handbook. That is really helpful information about the entire budget process, operating and capital. And the capital budget uh, pages start on 35. So capital budget documents uh, or information overview is pages 35 through 41 in that handbook. And I highly encourage you to read it. It gives you more of a sense of how the process goes. And, um, and then also that's the website where you'll find out, um, how, that's where you'll access CAPSIS in the future once you have your account information. So first step is contact a Senator of your choosing to get a sub account set up. And then, um, and then you go from there. So we will, I think at that point, I will, I will hand it over to Mariam about with her slides and we can go through a CAPSIS form here in a little bit. Thank you, Mercedes. Um, so our, so I, I, my name is Mariam and I'm with Alaska Trails. Um, last year, I guess this year, 2022, we um, embarked on this CAPSIS adventure for the first time ever for our organization. And um, it's kind of an example of newbies, newbies engaging with this process for the first time and um, having some success. We didn't get all the projects funded that we wanted to, but we, we got um, a significant amount of dollars uh, going to our partners for the project that we did submit. So um, at, at the same time, I also want to mention that we wouldn't be able to accomplish this without the support of uh, our partners and uh, allies in the legislature, particularly with um, Senator Tom Begich and Mercedes and Senator Bill Wilikowski and his legis legislative aide, Nick Mo and others. Um, and also um, I want to um, mention our partners, Anchorage Park Foundation, who also submitted projects for the Lawn Trail along with us and were instrumental in getting the funding. So I'm going to share my screen, if I may. Yes, I, I can. Okay, I see. All right. All right. Have a little presentation. Let's see, slideshow. Okay. 
So yeah, that was an adventure. Um, th at least that's how it felt for me. So um, I want to introduce, I guess many on this call may be familiar with Alaska Long Trail concept. Um, it's, a, it's an idea for uh, a continuous trail between Seward and Fairbanks that will pass through Anchorage and uh, be going very close to the road system and railroad system. And um, the, the well, Alaska, Alaska Trails serves as a convener and facilitator for this project, but we, but the actual work is going is, is done through the Alaska Long Trail Coalition. We have five regions with um, partners. We're working with partners in, in every of those in every one of those regions, and I have listed organizations that we work with our partners. So um, for CAPSIS, we um, Alaska Trails and Anchorage Park Foundation submitted. 15 projects altogether. We submitted 13 on behalf of uh, our partners in these regions and um, the Anchorage Park Foundation also submitted two for Anchorage. Um, so altogether we had 15 projects. Uh, we compiled them. So these are the projects. And so I want, well, maybe so there are 15. You can, you can see there, um, they spread along the 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 uh, proposed route between Seward and Fairbanks, so different different agencies and different uh, nonprofits uh, were the recipients of of the proposed projects, um, but they all were on the headline of Alaska Long Trail. So um, we started this process of fleshing out the entries for the projects in December, and for last year. Uh, the submissions opened about mid-December, mid and then the deadline was extended. Again, as Mercedes mentioned, this will be different for this year or next year because it depends on when uh, finance co-chairs open the process. And I have a link here, and I will send this slide deck to uh, Lee so she can um, post it on the website, or I'm not sure how the distribution goes. Um, so you can check out that link too. And I think it's the same link actually that uh, Mercedes put in the chat. Um, so the project entry is relatively simple. When you look at this, this is essentially the project submission form. Oops, go back. Um, and it looks a little bit maybe uh, involved or intimidating. However, um, it seemed well, okay, so the advice we got along the way from our allies is to keep it simple. Uh, legislators have very short time span and we um, basically focused on making the title shine or uh, make, make the title speak for itself and also just focus on the brief, um, the brief description of the project, which is one or two lines essentially. Um, yeah, so, but, and I, I can show you the entry that was submitted for one of the projects, which is basically one page. And Mercedes, did you, would you like to add anything to that? Sure, yeah, just that, am I, did I unmute myself? I did. Um, just that we, uh, we don't, you, do, you may not always know the answer to the question, and that's okay. It's totally fine to not have all the information. And uh, so if you don't actually know if the project is going to be requesting funding again next year and it requires you to ask that question, to answer that question, I would just, you know, be in touch with that office, the office that you want to uh, review your project, just get a sense of what they think. So it's okay to not have an answer and it's okay to ask your, um, the Senator or your representative, uh, whoever you're working with about um, how best to answer the question that would be the most appropriate for your project, because it just depends sometimes. And, um, but yeah, the total project cost, uh, like the description in the form is really helpful. Um, that might include funding you have already received. So make sure to include that. Um, if you include information about where you already got funding, like, um, for example, the Rasmussen Foundation has been a great source of many grants in the past for a number of projects that helped 
uh, fun thing. So that's something you would include as, yeah, we already got a million dollars from a, you know, uh, a group like that. Um, and that's really helpful. That really does showcase the community interest in your project. So the more detail that you have on funding you already have, that's really, really helpful. Um, and the funding already secured. So that's, that's extremely important. And, um, you know, like it says, including uh, in-kind donations, volunteer labor, things like that. And uh, the project deficit will be basically be the leftover money needed that uh, to complete the project outside of what you've already secured and what you're requesting. So if you still have a project deficit after that, then the answer is yes, you may need to request money again next year. But again, you may not know the answer to that and that's okay. So just contact the legislator that you're working with for a little uh, guidance, I think. But yeah. Um, but otherwise, yeah, like Miriam, you're doing great. If you want to continue on, unless you want me to add anything else. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll get, go to the next slide. Um, thanks, Mercedes. If I succeed. Oh, yeah. Okay. So um, let's see if I can click. Oh, no, I can't. Let's see. I wanted to show the example of, no, it doesn't let me. Um, Maybe I can show it later. Um, it's basically an entry for one of the projects that we submitted and uh, it's a one page entry, um, but maybe I can do it at the end. Um, so after, it was, after we submitted those projects by the February deadline, that was February 15th last year, um, in my opinion, that's when the actual work started. So that means um, a lot of, so the, the post submission period is when when there's we engaged with many with a lot of legislators we um ramped up the support for the projects uh we provided uh, recruited people to do public testimony and write letters of support so there was a lot of engagement in those um post submission months so in the and here are the actual the the actual steps that we we engaged in so we did look for people to write direct letters of support to the legislators that um to to yeah to uh various legis legislators along the the route and we also um have resolutions of support for the project in the, uh, that we collected from assemblies from um uh, nonprofits from agencies and submitted as a bundle to the legislature and also again we uh, looked for key um well, well looked for for folks who could do public testimony when that was available i think it's it happens in march and april uh and th these examples of um of support of great organizations and agencies that provided support not an not a comprehensive list but um uh some of it and then then the key to uh, our process was contacting state legislators for uh, those projects that were in their districts. So um, the 15 project that we submitted had um, a multitude of uh, legislative districts, many legis many senators and uh, representatives along the way. So there was a lot of folks to contact and uh, solicit their support, well, uh, ask for their support through emails, calls, and Zoom meetings. Um, when I wrote find sponsors, um, that, that refers to finding legislative sponsors, so legislators who could stand behind the projects that we submitted. Um, and yes, and the last step here is also key, um, as Mercedes mentioned, uh, establishing a relationship with finance committee chairs, co-chairs co is... Um, is very important both in senate and the house and let's see well um yeah i'll go here so after the legislative session ends if uh, you've done all the work that you could and um success your projects end up in the state budget our, pro our all of our 15 projects were successfully added to the state budget by the state legislature which we'll be very grateful for, but that's not the end of the road because then after the legislative session ends, uh, then the budget goes to for approval to the governor, and um, 
and then the governor looks through the budget with a red pen. And uh, so that's a key time when um, you would want to engage with the governor and build report. And you can try to do directly, if possible, you have avenues to do that, or find spokespeople, key messengers that could speak to governor or his staff, um, her staff, you know, um, about um, the project. Uh, the projects. So yeah, that's the that's the process. And Mercedes, did I miss anything? No, I'll just add on. Um... So there was a question on the chat as well earlier uh, on a private question about contacting house representatives. And yes, your house representatives can give you a sub account as well. Um, please forgive me that I might be a little biased towards the Senate, <laughs> but, uh, but I will say, I should have touched on this earlier too, I meant to, was the Senate typically takes the budget, the capital budget first, while the house works on the operating budget first. So that they're both working on one of those major budgets at the same time and then they switch ideally. You know, that that's essentially the goal anyway. And um, so that's just typically how it goes. And then the Senator works with the representatives in their district typically. Again, that can be a little different because um, that's where things can get political, where sometimes a senator may be may have totally different politics, different uh, goals, different everything from the House representatives in that same district. That's entirely possible, but it's really up to you. Who, who do you feel the most comfortable contacting? Um, it'll, you know, ideally the information will still get into what um, typically Mercedes, um, I don't think, well, I can't hear you. Um, no sound. Hey, Mercedes, if you can hear us, we can't hear or see you. Um, well, um, let's give her a moment to log yeah. back in. While she's logging back in, I will just say a few more words about our process. Um, let's see. So um, we, as I mentioned, the governor is the last step in this process. And typically that uh, uh, governor looks at the budget in end of May and June, uh, depending on the year. And so, um, as I mentioned, all 15 projects that we submitted um, that Alaska Trails and Anchorage Park Foundation submit, submitted for the launch trail were included in the state budget, but then the governor uh, vetoed eight of them and left seven with, um, yeah, so let's see, we are still very happy for the outcome because that gave us uh, four uh, Point two two million dollars for the seven projects in the Anchorage area. Um, and I want to say that uh, it wouldn't have happened without Senator Begich's help. So it's important to have your Senate or your representatives, your senators on board or well, on board or advocating directly for your projects with the governor. Uh, unless um, the governor is really, really interested in the projects himself. Hi, sorry guys. <laughs> it just, I didn't even touch it. You know how that goes. Te technology is here to help you. Sorry about that. Um, I don't wanna jump on where you are. I just wanna let you know I'm back. Thanks Mercedes. Um, yeah, I'm just finishing up, just telling our story. So that's the yellow um, highlighted projects that we got a funding for, and we are hoping, we're planning to um, to work with the legislature through the same process this year to get funding for revised projects that were not funded last year. Yeah, I think, I think that that's an important message, Mariam, is it's not one and done. And I think um, Mercedes alluded to it earlier when she gave the example of like, maybe a project's been in CAPSIS since 2016. You got to keep at it. Don't, you know, this is play the long game. Um, don't, uh, you know, don't give up. And um, 
And yeah, I guess that's the short story. And you, you just illustrated that with your commitment to going back again to get some other projects yeah. funded or, or you know, modified. Um, yeah. We have a question from our audience and that is that um, uh, you're welcome. Either of you can answer that. But when you when an organization gets a sub account, is that sub account for the organization or the district or what is it a sub account of? Yeah, I can answer that. Great question. The sub account is uh, the is the organization. So. Um, you know, I, I hope it's okay that I use them as examples. Uh, so community councils, for example, um, downtown community council may create their own uh, their own sub account so that they can submit requests that the downtown community council in Anchorage had agreed upon to request from the state legislature. So that their community council president may apply for their own sub account. Uh, likewise, nonprofits like the food bank, they had terrific examples of submissions. Um, they, uh, they applied for a sub account as the food bank of Alaska, and of course the um, Alaska trails too. So it's the, whatever entity that would be receiving the money is the one that typically applies for it. And um, so, yeah, if you, if you might be applying for a number of different organizations, it would, it just depends on what organization organization is asking for the funds. So if you if you're wearing a hat for all three of them, I would be very clear about which organization is is asking for the money. Are they the ones going to implement the money if they received it or if they're the ones that um, if that makes sense. So I hope that I hope that answers that question. Yeah, thank you. And I also want to, to add to that that um, Alaska Trail submitted 13 projects and none of them, none of the projects were uh, allocated to Alaska Trails. So we submitted those projects on behalf of different agencies and organizations. So you don't have to, I guess, as well, at, at the same time, we don't, you don't have to um, be the recipient of the money, an organization that received the money to get the sub account. Right. right. Yeah. So I hope that doesn't like they're both correct. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's funny how this works, but yeah. Um, yes, that is correct. I do. And at this time, um, I, I'd welcome other questions from the audience. You can um, go into the reactions, um, little smiley face at the bottom of the screen. And there you can raise. It. You can see a thing that says "raise your hand." Um, if that's uh, too tricky, just go ahead and unmute yourself and um, jump in, and we'll take questions uh, for Mariam and Mercedes at this time. And while you're thinking of your questions, I'll kick it off, Mariam. Um, uh, what's the, if there was one piece of advice from things that you learned from this process this past year, what was the biggest aha moment or something that you would change about yes. what you did next year, or, you know, the best tip you can provide for our listeners? Don't put it on. No, don't put it on. Um, right. Um, well, the, I guess the, piece of advice that um, I would give um, is to keep the process steady. And what I mean is, it seems like for us, the key in the whole, in this whole um, process was engagement with various uh, legislators and making sure that they're informed about the project and um, and they know about it and they have the correct information. And so to keep the process steady, but also not to be pesky. What I mean is uh, we also, it's a kind of a fine line to be, um, to, be to, to make sure that, they, that you're, you're visible, but at the same time that you're not annoying, right? Uh, with, with your um, uh, constant, you know, bombardment or you know um emails and calls so be patient but at the same time be uh consistent with your outreach 
Okay. So that's one thing. Um, and it's, again, it's a fine line. And I think the key for us in this process was finding outstanding allies in the legislature. And again, that's that goes, I mean, we wouldn't be able to do it without the support and guidance from Mercedes and uh, Senator Begich and um, Senator Bill Belichowski. So finding those legislators who can uh, provide advice and uh, guide you through the process is is key. What would what would we do different or um, you know better? I think. Well, obviously we we kind of um, no, I, I wouldn't say failed because because it's still a success. Well, we we needed to establish better relationships or uh, with uh, opposition to the project, I guess, and inform them better because that's probably why the governor vetoed uh, a lot of those projects because so so get um get in better connection to the governor and his um um yeah the critics right mm -hmm. or the yeah that's that's really great advice um and I think I want to say um you know this is probably the single the, the appropriations for the long trail this year is probably the single biggest investment the state legislature has made in outdoor recreation in, I think, decades. So I think it's a huge win, Mariam. And um, and I know you were, <laughs> you know, and I appreciate you going back for it, but just congratulations for the hard work that you guys did in putting it together and getting that that big success. It's, it was really big. We have a couple other questions. I'm going to take um, first Eric Lynchfield, Lynch fight. I'm sorry, Eric, I'm going to murder your name. Um, he's got his hand up. And then after that, Steve Wilson will ask your question. But Eric, go ahead and unmute yourself and, um, and ask your question. You did get it right the second time. So my question is, for the trails that were awarded, um, it says the Alaska DNR the Outdoor Recreation Division is responsible. What, what does that mean? Are they going to build the trail? Yes. Um, yes, essentially. It was their project. Um, so they the money is going to them and they're going to build the trail or whatever they need to do, whatever they, however they want to allocate the money, whatever was in the project um, description. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Did that answer your question? Um, it did in part, I guess, um, I, we got a quote two years ago from Alaska DOT on doing a 10 mile trail and they gave us a quote. So we have kind of the total package of what it would cost to do, but it sounded, it seemed to me that DOT was going to be responsible for doing the trail, which kind of surprised me. Is, I mean, is that, is that typical? DOT is Um, hmm. Well, I'm not sure. I'm I'm not sure. Uh, I guess I don't know the context of, um, of of the project that you're talking about, Eric. I'm sorry because so in this particular case, um, we're submitting. We were submitting Alaska Trails in particular was as a nonprofit was submitting projects into capital um, budget system through this, um, what's it called, the sub-account. Um, and we were submitting on behalf of several agencies and organizations. So if, I guess if you were to submit a project through CAPSIS and um, identify DOT as a recipient, then the money, money would go to uh, Alaska DOT for whatever project that you submit. But, Thank that you, that makes, that makes sense. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and then uh, from from our online uh, world, uh, what can you um, tell us about the management of funds if they're received? Are those funds reimbursable or does an organization have to have expertise in government fund accounting and such? I, I think I know the answer to this, but I'm going to let our ac experts respond.
let Mercedes answer that because I'm not very sure. Sure, this is from Steve. I just wanted to reread it. You know, I think it depends, Steve, on that. Um, that's a really good question. Uh, so, for example, there's a lot of a lot of capital projects. Just kind of dovetailing on the last question a little bit too. A lot of capital projects are actually going to be distributed by the Department of Commerce. So the so for the community council example is a really good one because they are a part of they're associated with the municipality. They're not directly the municipality, but they may want to. Um, receive $25,000 from, they say it was in the budget for a community garden. And then uh, the Department of Commerce actually is the one that distributes the funds. So the community council pre president, who's your neighbor, you know, as simple as that will actually be the contact for that small project. Um, so that's, that's a smaller scale example of a really small project that's going to make, make a huge difference in that community. Um, but you don't have to have somebody who's an expert in government fund accounting. It's mostly just to be the point of contact and be ready to receive the funds when the Department of Commerce calls and you can distribute it on behalf of the community council, for example. Um, but for these larger projects, that's very, that could be a little bit more complicated. And I think that will be, you know, the best to be determined through your um, legislator's office that you're working with. They can help you with that information uh, with the department. So I've had to walk through a few different project requests with the department directly. We've often served as a liaison between uh, the person requesting money for a project and a department. That's totally in our realm as a legislative office. Um, if you need a little bit more guidance, perhaps your legislator could help you with that. That's a really good question. All right. This is Mercedes. Diana. This is Diana and the Anchorage Park Foundation. We did get one. We got two grants and the 800,000 for the wayfinding for the long trail in Anchorage and the moose loop in Anchorage. It, both of them actually are reimbursable. And so we do have to come up with the money and then submit invoices and then they'll, they'll reimburse us for those grants. So on ours anyway, Ours was straight to Anchorage Park Foundation, but it's just over five years. We're trying to do it in two years because we want to show progress, but the over five year period submitting invoices and getting reimbursed with, um, yeah, Lindsay Reese, I think is her name at, at um, Commerce. Thanks, Diana. Um, and for those who don't know Diana with Anchorage Park Foundation, she used to be a legislative staffer, so she's pretty savvy about all this as well. Yeah, um, thank you. And then, uh, Mercedes, is there an updated list of the legislators' contact information yet, or when would you expect to see that? Not yet. Uh, also a good question. That will be found on the akledge.gov website under publications. So the main legislature's website has a bar for publications and that's usually there. Um, it's probably going to be more around the first day of session around January 17. Uh, so those who are retiring, such as my boss, my current one, uh, he's still technically a senator through January 16th. So um, so they still have that information out there. So I think it'll be more likely updated by January 17th. And then um, likewise, and that's something I'm working on as in the Senate rules capacity is office assignments and phone numbers will have to have a little time to get figured out as well. Um, typically, and this may help you as you contact your incomings, there's a lot of new members. There's 17 new members that we expect in the House. And, you know, pending a couple of these court cases, but, you know, let's just assume as it stands right now, 17 members in the House that are new, and then there are seven incoming senators. So it's a lot of new people. And the number, the phone numbers will be different. They tend to, they tend to stay with the district. So, um, but it depends. Um, so if a House member moved to the Senate, like Representative Merrick is joining us in the Senate, her phone number will change, will stay the same so that you can still contact the same person, the same number. So, so if that helps you get a little sense of how to contact people before the big list is up, uh, you can 
go roughly more or less about who uh, had preceded them in that district. They'll probably have the same number if they're a freshman. And but uh, but typically, when a House member moves to the Senate, they keep their contact information and um, and the office room assignments for the Senate, I can tell you, will be public very soon, but not that soon. And um, I mean, they're determined, we just have to get there. And then the house, unfortunately, will take a little bit of time. Uh, so those, the, those conversations are ongoing. So their emails are all pretty much the same as the same, um, the same uh, format. So it's always rep.firstname.lastname at kledge.gov. I'll put those in the chat as well. Um, and then, you know, when you call their office, you can figure out their staff. But again, it may take a little time, particularly on the staff piece, to get that information out. It, it may not be the first day of session, but it certainly won't be before that, from what I understand. Great. Um, I have a question, um, kind of a strategy question, I guess, um, uh, addressed to either of you. But in rural areas like Haynes, is it advisable to have the proposal go through the Haynes Borough so as not to be competing with their CAPSIS list? And, and how would the relationship be different from a separate entity submitting? I'm not sure I get that part. And then can local advocates make the support contacts even if the proposal is part of the borough's CAPSIS list? So what is that kind of relationship between the local government and maybe a nonprofit you know, uh, that's interested in uh, applying for some funding um, and do they duplicate efforts? Would it be competitive or do they even think of it that way um, in terms of uh, their strategy submitting to CAPSIS? And Carol, feel free to let me know if I'm on the right track on this question. Uh, I think, and it's a good question. Just wanna make sure I, I grasp it right. Um, Basically, if you if a community such as Haynes say um, it's a project that's being submitted both to the Haynes Borough and at the state level, if if I understand that correctly, they're not necessarily competing out of the state. N not necessarily. It's good to know that the municipality could be looking at it as well, uh, but it's not the the capital the state capital project system isn't isn't like at the federal level where I think that happens sometimes. Um, but you know, generally, it's it's important for the state to be aware that there could be other funding options there. So it's it's you know the more communication the better essentially. Um, so I would just hate to say that it's it's mutually exclusive. I I wouldn't go that far. But again, it's I think it's really kind of a case by case thing. But um, but yeah, I mean, if you have a resolution or something like that from a local community, that is really good backup for the state submissions. So if um, the Haynes Borough said, hey, we really support this project and we would like to support, um, you know, submit a letter of recommendation or, or support to the state for this, that's great. That's excellent, excellent backup material and highly, highly recommend. Um, and if, so if it's not necessarily a project that the Haynes Borough will administer, but the city, the city government, the local government supports it, um, they can still submit a letter of support that would be very helpful. Um, so even if they're not necessarily a funder, they, you know, they could, it would show community support and that's really helpful for sure. Um, if that helps to answer your question, hopefully. All right. Wow, this is just info packed. He brought the beef. Um, um, are there any other questions out there um, that we can address? So I think Camille asked um, if uh, Alaska Trails was a sub account or the organizations who received the fund was sub accounts. And it was just Alaska Trails because the sub account is needed for the organization that submits projects. So just us. I, I have a question. Um, is the CAPSIS sub account connected to the representative or senator that you request it from? Or is once you receive it, um, it's independent of that? That is, if your senator or representative leaves office, does the sub account go dormant? 
Uh, you'll have to request a new sub account uh, either way. Um, so I actually, none of us can actually open CAPSIS right now. So from what I understand, Senator Begich's is already done, which is, you know, I couldn't, I can't access it as an example. So that was, you know, I have all the documents, but I can't access it on that website right now. Um, my understanding is you'll have to request a new sub account each term, um, but more more information will be forthcoming on that to clarify. And um, but yeah, the when you get a so if you come to our office and Senator Begich provides you a sub account, then um, and then you need a new one because he's leaving office, you'll have to find another person just to give you that information to be able to do it. But it's not necessarily associated with Senator Begich. It's just giving you the ability to create the sub account. And you may ask us for a sub account um, and not even be asking for funding for a project that's in his district. That's okay. So it's just as long as a, as a member can help you get hooked up with a sub account login information and, um, and get that associated for you. So um, but it doesn't have to, excuse me, it doesn't have to be associated with that member that uh, it's not an automatic sponsorship, basically. There, so somebody who assists you with a sub account does not necessarily mean that they will sponsor that project. And, and then your project will still stay in the system, even though legislators will move about and change. I, in the deep archives of the magical world of CAPSIS, yes, but I think they do disappear after a couple of years. But um, when they are submitted and they're part of the public process, that's where it becomes more permanent. So, um, but again, the CAPSIS program is changing all the time. Um, they're doing a lot of updates to the thing uh, right now, largely on the districts and updating the districts. So some of this stuff could be could be very fluid. It could change. They may be able to. Um, be able to access that more readily in the future. More, one more question in regards. So, so just from kind of long-term strategy, given senators typically last longer than House members, we should probably, and you said they first look at capital budget. It's, you probably look at senators before a House rep for finding that sub account. Yeah. And, project sponsor. Right. I mean, it never hurts. I mean, essentially, I'm a huge uh, proponent of saying the more communication, the better. So while the Senate offices typically take the lead on capital budget requests, and then they typically work with their House members, um, it's certainly worth checking in with those associated House members to say, hey, I've contacted Senator Smith and she's helping me with this project. I want to make sure that you're aware that this is in CAPSIS as well so you can get a chance to see it. And um, so it's very advantageous to be in touch on both sides. Uh, it's just a matter of duplicating work. So typically the Senate office will take the lead of putting together all the requests and um, but again, it's always good to check in with the associate house members so that they're aware that the request is in there and they're oh, they're ready to speak to it if anybody asks them about it. Um, but yeah, I mean, I generally recommend going to the Senate office first, but again, it may not be the member that you choose, the, that you may have the best relationship with. Maybe you already know that house member better and that's okay. Um, they'll, they'll, they can help you either way. Great. We've got probably time for one more question if it's out there. And you can unmute and ask away. And barring none, I'd like to thank everyone who um, took part in this Lunch and Learn for being here today and learning, getting your, um, upping your legislative IQ. Um, thank you so much to Mariam. And, and Mercedes for um, a really um, informative session, uh, really, I think mostly easy to understand and um, your guidance and help is greatly appreciated. And Steve um, Cleary for suggesting the idea. Um, and uh, thank you for that and for always being such a strong partner. So with that, I will sign off and wish everyone um, a happy holiday season. Um, rest up, recharge, get reset and ready for um, lots of good things to come in 2023. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you all Thank very you. much too. Thanks everybody. Happy holidays. Everyone.